Welcome back to Station It Is. It's time for a really, really important episode. This is something unlike anything you've seen so far in On Mars, and uh, it's very, very important. It is, however, going to involve electronics, but it won't be this sort of electronics, okay? There's a very new system that's just come into the game, or a new sort of interface, for doing all of this stuff. So if this sort of stuff you see on the wall here intimidated you, or you have problems with that, uh, there is a new low-level programming language that we can use. So let's get to that and take a look. So in your ElectroPrint, you will see um, a new recipe near the bottom, or currently near the bottom, who knows, <laughs> called the Programmable Chip Motherboard, okay? So if you make one of those, and you also want to just get some processors, uh, I've got some in my backpack, just the regular kind, you'll see if you put these on a wall, if you scroll through, there's a new programmable chip PGM chip. So this is a variant of the processor, and it has some good important things that you can do with it. So these buttons on the front are the inputs. You can have up to three inputs, and there is only one output. And the output is a bit limiting, there's only one. Uh, so I, I, I would prefer at least two, but that's, that's an, a topic for another day. But yes, uh, the important point about this is that it's programmable. So unlike this sort of setup where we have to lay things out and then select inputs and outputs and everything else, we can collapse a lot of electronics now down onto this chip. So this episode may well be a fairly short one, but I just wanted to cover it just to make sure you're all aware of it because there's probably going to be a lot of people messing around with this system. So let's get it started and uh, I'll keep it as brief and to the point as possible. We'll take a break from the usual kind of buildy kind of things just to show you this system. So you'll see up here, uh, the, currently these are all on because I've turned off my power saving setting just so I can um, <laughs> I can do stuff up here when the sun's gone down and this is still working there's, there's no actual change to this other than uh, what I actually want to do is be able to address these values this logic reader so we've got these two values that are continually changing and that will just help me debug things a little bit by uh, by looking at them so I've got a computer up here everything from here this way is new that's just the same system as before and by the side of the computer, we've got a logic programmable chip placed down. And I've already set these buttons to be the input. So there is button one, button three, and button two. Don't know why they're named that way. That's just the way that the default is. And I've set this one to logic reader theta, this one to logic reader fine, that one not too well, that's connected to corrected vertical at the moment, but we don't need that that to actually to look at this demonstration. In fact, we only need one input really, just to really look at this. I've got a logic writer that is looking at this. And that logic writer is then outputting to this. So you can see quite easily what the state of this is without me looking at it. Okay. And this episode is going to be a bit of a <laughs> programming episode. <laughs> I've not really done any of those before because we haven't had this system. But let's boot things up. So you can see we have a motherboard in here. So, yeah, programmable chip motherboard. The icon isn't even done for it yet. It's that new. And here we have programmable chip interface. So at the top left we have, we can choose the chip. In this case we've only got one in the network, so, uh, or in the sub-network, so it's right here. And then we can press import and export. Now they don't look like they do anything, but that's because there's no actual code in here at the moment. What we have in the chip is a number of different registers and a different inputs and different outputs. So let's go through them. There are three inputs and it's you can see on the model there are 0, 1, and 2. So I0, I1, I2 are the inputs and the programmable interface. The output is just the letter O. Nothing, nothing special there. And again, there's only one output, which is sort of limiting, but we'll get there. And then internally, there are five registers. Or think of them as five memory chips, just like this, if you like, that uh, we can store values in. And they're called, well, yeah, I've, said, I've already said the word register, but yes, they're essentially just memory locations we can store values in. And that's R0 through R to 4. Uh, sorry, R0 through R4, yeah. So five values. Again, everything is zero indexed because programming is just like that. All right, so we can then click on this little edit button and you'll see in the middle of the screen it goes dark and uh, hopefully you can see a little, when I click on it, there's a little cursor at the top of the screen. So what can we do? Well, we can do a bunch of things. Uh, let's start by just assigning or making this 
zero or on the right hand side something else all right so we need to use commands and these are very similar to low level languages um, assembler assembly whatever you want to actually call that uh, etc so uh, we're going to use the command move and you may as well think of this as store and contrary to what you might think we're not going to say move three equals something uh, what we actually do, we have to do this a little bit backwards. So if you're used to programming, you're used to that already, that backwards sort of way of thinking. So for example, var x equals 30, um, you're assigning 30 to x. You're not, you're not equating the two. You're not saying x is, is the same thing as 30. All you're actually doing is assigning the value. So there's a, there's a much shorter way of doing that in low level languages. And that is just move the, the destination. In this case, um, let's say zero. Sorry, not zero, O, and then 30. Okay, so we're saying store the value of 30 in the output. Now, if I just did that and press export, nothing much would happen. So I want to add a couple more lines that I'm probably going to be adding to all of these that I'll explain in a second. Uh, let's just save that and export. Still isn't working. And that's what I was just wondering about, the ability to store things in that O output so let's just edit this for a second and then i'll explain what i'm actually doing so we're going to just take a second command and then say o r zero and export and it's 30. so what's going on here well it seems for some reason you can't take an input or a direct value and just output it for some reason it needs to go through a register and just to test that let's just change this to 45 and double check to make sure I'm not being completely crazy here. Export it again, and nothing's happening. Still set to 30. So it seems you can't just take a value and put it straight to the output. Not that you'll probably want to do that in most cases, but you get the idea. You just can't do that at the moment. That could just be a bug. So what are we doing with the first line? So move, we're saying R0. So that's the first memory location. We're storing a value of 45. We're then going to do the same thing. We're going to move that stored value to the output. Then we're going to do this line that says yield. All that means really as far as you're concerned, uh, if you're thinking of Ruby and Python and stuff, you may think of something else. But as far as you're concerned, um, it just means wait for the next power tick. So every half a second. And then J0 is the same as the go to command in basic or something. So jump back to zero. In this case, the lines, unlike a regular code editor, they start on line zero. So that's zero, that's one two and three. So this is basically saying <laughs> every time it goes through this, it's going to take 45, put it to that memory chip inside this program, uh, this programmable chip, move that to the output and then go back around. So if I then run this one, it should change to 45. And there we go. Of course, that is evaluating every, every half second, but uh, yeah, well, that's uh, that's fine. Let's just actually take that J0 off here and let's just see if it goes to 55. Will it actually work if we just evaluate it once? It should do, but it's not. Yeah, for some reason, again, it needs to be <laughs> continually evaluated. Might be a bug, might not be, but just remember to end the last two lines uh, or have the last two lines being yield and J space zero. Save, export, and 55. Good. So we've got a basic programming up and running, and hopefully that should not be a um, too taxing for, <laughs> for you, unless you really don't like programming, in which case, well, you have this system to figure things out graphically. It'll be very nice in the future to have both of these. Now, I very much expect people to be doing a lot more with this kind of programming. Um, it has pretty much all the basic operations from your math processors. And one thing I just wanted to try from the post I've seen, I think it's missing the trig functions at the moment, which makes this really annoying if that's the case. Uh, let me just try it. So let's just uh, let's just take in a value of, let's say 45 again, all right? And that's in R0. So let's just see, can we do something like, uh, we would have to, well, we would have to store sign R0 somewhere. And I don't see, yeah, we would have to literally do something like sign R1, R0. And then sign would end up be in R1, 
which we would then have to say move um, O R one, and let me just see with if that actually works. I don't expect it to work, but if it does, cool. No, that's not working there because it's not zero, surprisingly, because uh, it's sine forty five. Okay, so um, if we can't do that, let me just double check to make sure it's not the full pronunciation or the full spelling of sine. Sine, no. So we can't do sine, at least not directly. <laughs> there are ways around that, and that could get quite heavy into uh, into lines of code. Um, but if we can't do that, then let's just look at some of the simple manipulations, okay? So let's say we want to, um, I don't know, let's say multiply. So MUL R1, um, ooh, actually, that's a good point. We need three operators here. So we're gonna say R1, then we're gonna say what we want to multiply up. So it doesn't really matter which way around we have here. So R0 and let's say two, okay? And then move uh, that, you know, 45 times two and put it into the output yield and around we go. And hopefully, yep, we get 90. Good, so the basic multiplication, division, etc. all that's fine. So it's add, sub, mul, div, and mod, mod being modulo, etc. So uh, you could do uh, mod like that. And that's probably be uh, one. Yep, there you go. Uh, modulo is just the remainder. So 45 modulo two is basically um, 44, which is the, the actual uh, first part. And then it's one remainder. Okay, so all the basic stuff is there. You can square root, SQRT, and a bunch of other stuff as well. All the kind of little bits and pieces we've got already in the system, mins, maxes, uh, absolute logs, um, square roots, rounding, truncation, cell floor, all the stuff that you've got on the regular kind of stuff. I will put a link below in the description to a post that shows you all the operations that we can actually do. Okay. Okay, now we don't have to use just simple sums. We can do more complex things. So 0 0.990, let's see if that's actually what I actually get over here. Sine of theta, 0 0.990, good. So I'm gonna to, to show you what sine looks like as an approximation if you don't have a sine operator. Don't panic. <laughs> I will copy and paste this into a gist that you can view online. And I'm sure some people will come up with a two-liner Especially if someone introduces like a sine operator into the uh, the the chip before uh, this actually gets out to you guys, but we'll see. There isn't one at the time of recording, so here we have sine or there thereabouts. Don't panic, okay? What this is actually doing is taking in the input, it's multiplying it by that value that converts it to radians. That's all that it's doing, and then it does a modulo of two pi, and all that means is. Now R0 is somewhere between 0 and 2 pi. That's 6.28-ish, okay? And that's all that happens. So this is what we need to do to be able to use a Taylor series. So Taylor series, it's just a few terms and we're just alternately uh, adding and subtracting them. Okay, so the first term is now set to R0 and it's in radians and it's known to be between 0 and 2 pi. And then we're just copying it across into three other terms, into three other uh, registers. Then each of these blocks is doing something to each of those copies. So the first copy we want to cube. So multiply it by itself and store it in itself, if you like, and then by the original copy, and then that's a cube. And we divide it by six, divide and store it back in R1. So that's the second term. First term is R0, second term is R1. We do the same thing with R2. We're divided by 120, and this time we are taking it to the power of 5. So you can get to the power of 4 easily just by repeating the same thing. So it's basically a square, and then you square the square, and that gets to the power of 4, and then you do it again, again with the original value, you get to power of 5. And you can do a very similar, well, you can't do exactly uh, like three of these lines, because you'll get to the power of 8, then you've got to do a different operation. So just for simplicity, rather than changing the multiply line, just do it twice to get to the power of 4, power five, power six, power seven, etc. You can do a bit of optimization then to get that a little bit shorter, but just for simplicity's sake. And then divide by 5,040. Don't worry about these values. What you're basically doing is three factorial, five factorial, uh, seven factorial, I think that is. And 
each of these blocks is basically then storing that value. And all that we're then doing is taking the R0 terms, the first term. So that is, if it was 50, then it would be 50. And then minus the second term, storing it in R4. Taking R4, adding the third term. Taking R4, subtracting the fourth term. Okay. And then all we're really doing is moving the output into O, which is the output, yielding and jumping back to line zero. So that is sine. <laughs> and this is why I want a sine operator, because that would make that so much easier. There's already things like square root operator, absolute and min max, and all kinds of other stuff. But you get the idea. You can do all the kind of maths that you actually need to in the computer. And we have a value that's that's pretty accurate. Uh, it's not perfect, but I'm not sure how these chips are doing under the scenes, behind the scenes anyway. These could be doing exactly the same things underneath underneath the the, the covers. More than likely, though, they're actually using the the, the math libraries in in whatever this is programmed in C sharp probably. Uh, in any case, that is a, an approximation for sine. Now you could use that in combination with each of these four. And different because there are different approximations for each of them so we need sine cosine another sine and a tan all right so you can use those with that formula and the other ones you can find them online don't worry they're not all that hard but i suspect by the time we've actually finished we'll probably end up with a sine operator in the chip in any case that's why i'm not really doing the rest of this keeping this video quite short just so you get a chance to play with this before uh before we do some more research and hopefully they'll patch it in. In any case, uh, this then math unit will then take sine phi multiplied by sine of theta. This one does cos of phi multiplied by tan of theta. So if you did all that in the code, you would get rid of six chips easily and replace it with one chip. And I think it's like 50 watts, that, that, uh, that, that chip. So you can already get rid of six of those. And this is only in really complicated cases where you need to do sine. If you wanted much simpler cases, let's say, for example, um, if we just hop over, whoop, let's hop over here, you'll see, you know, we've got our Schmidt trigger over here. If you wanted a single chip doing this, um, well, in this case, it's a compare and a select. So, you know, the, the argument for doing it here perhaps isn't quite as much, but there are certainly, I've already seen thermostats being done online. And there'll be plenty more options to actually do in the future. So again, I'm not going to do a full episode here. Just really a really nice announcement of this, this chip. We'll get our teeth into it in the coming days and weeks, no doubt. Air tank low. Oh, okay. Air tank is low. Uh, that's me needing more air. Yes, it is. Okay, so I will go and fill up with more air and leave it there. So a demonstration. See what you think come up with some stuff and uh, discuss in the comments. And I will see you next episode for some more Stationeers. If you've liked this episode, I really hope you have. <laughs> if it's too programmatic for you, yeah, don't worry that much. Um, there is plenty, plenty more to come and I will explain it or just leave you a copy and paste version and you can just copy and paste and modify it yourself uh, quite easily. I think this is more of a, um, a candidate for, for checking that as is perhaps a battery low value. So if we can read in all the values, we can modify it all in code and then just output like a, an LED display saying, you know, what percentage uh, of our battery we're on or something along those sort of lines. And we can read into other systems to say, is the battery low? And we just tell, you know, is it less than 40% or is it one or zero? You know, that kind of thing. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching.